Today on Investigate TV Plus, dentist handling double duty acting as surgeon and anesthesiologist during procedures. I'm T. Chappelle. And I'm Lee Zurich. Although deaths in the dental chair are rare, our investigation uncovers how lax regulations in some states could put patients at risk. Plus, an unlikely partnership between investigators and animators. I used to watch this stuff as a kid and always dream about being able to do this. We show you how technology used to create avatars and video games is helping the police put a face to unidentified remains. Then a husband tells a story of hope, humility, and unconditional love. Either you're going to be a caregiver, you're going to know a caregiver, but you're going to get involved somehow in-depth stories that inform and inspire. You're watching Investigate TV Plus. When you need surgery, an anesthesiologist typically handles the sedation and monitoring while another provider focuses on the procedure. But that's not always the case when you sit in the dentist chair for oral surgery. The dentists are often allowed to handle both anesthesia and surgery. Studies have shown dental anesthesia deaths are rare, with the National Institutes of Health reporting mortality rates somewhere around 3 in 1 million. But medical advocates we spoke to say most anesthesia-related dental deaths can be prevented. Investigator Josie Sturman speaks with a widow who's pushing for change to protect patients. Dr. Henry Patel was a stealth operator in the operating room, a renowned North Carolina cardiologist with a heart of gold. He was a super specialist in implanting pacemakers and defibrillators and he loved his job probably as much as he loved us. <laughs> a love lost in July 2020 when Sheetal Patel says her husband booked a quick and routine dental procedure at this Wilmington practice. Records obtained by our national investigative team show Patel's oxygen levels and heart rate dropped while he was being sedated for a simple dental implant. And I'm like, but what could have happened? Is he breathing? Is he breathing? When EMS arrived 20 minutes after the crisis began, he wasn't. Patel was in cardiac arrest with no pulse. But records show the dentist involved had made no attempts at CPR, and the team failed to successfully carry out several other life-saving measures. He died three days later. Henry died because the people who were looking after him in that office were not trained. No other medical field allows this. Okay, we call it the medical model. The only people who don't follow it and they're allowed not to follow it are dentists. In a hospital or surgery center, that medical model is what you're probably used to if you've been deeply sedated for something like a colonoscopy or put under general anesthesia for a hip replacement or heart surgery. One doctor or specialized nurse knocks you out and watches your vital signs while someone else performs the procedure. That way there's skilled backup if you stop breathing. But when you go to your dentist's office, state regulations nationwide often allow them to do something other medical professionals generally do not, handle both anesthesia and surgery. I honestly don't see how you can do that and operate in the mouth and, and truly recognize when things have gotten out of hand. Dr. Charles Cote, professor emeritus of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School, helped to create critical guidelines for dental sedation and anesthesia. Those guidelines, Cote explains, recommend a dentist doing surgery should be accompanied by another provider with specific airway rescue training, be it another oral surgeon, an anesthesiologist, or a nurse anesthetist, with both people specially trained for emergencies. But despite support from major medical groups, the guidelines are not universally implemented in states across the U.S. And nobody should die having a dental procedure. But deaths can and do happen in the dentist chair, with the 2015 study finding dental deaths and brain injuries linked to deep sedation and general anesthesia most likely to happen more than once a month. Our national investigative team looked more recently, spending months digging up dental anesthesia and sedation cases nationwide where patients died or were seriously hurt. Using records from the last five years, we uncovered at least 26 anesthesia-related deaths in 13 states. I suspect that's the tip of the iceberg. 
Our look at state records also found at least 14 deaths where the dentist delayed calling 911, waited or never performed CPR, failed to provide adequate or timely emergency care, or administer life-saving drugs to reverse the effects of anesthesia. I would really love to, for the uh, dental community to grab onto this as a, as a societal issue to protect their patients and go back and look at what's happening. Cote says an analysis of closed malpractice cases would give the dental community a more concrete sense of how often adverse anesthesia events happen, something we asked the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons about. They refused to answer questions about that and other topics, even after originally asking for additional time to respond. Still, Dr. Cote, Sheetal Patel and other medical advocates continue lobbying for that second highly skilled provider to be part of dental surgery. Just imagine if they had been well trained, knew what they were doing, or even had attempted CPR on Henry, he would have lived. The training of those involved in routine dental surgery was never something Patel thought to ask about. Now she's a human megaphone to make sure others do. Silence won't get me anywhere. I will use every penny I have to keep fighting because no one should come back or come out of a dentist office as a widow. Our team repeatedly contacted the dentist involved in Dr. Patel's death and his attorney. Neither responded with comment for this story. The dentist's license has been permanently surrendered. In Washington, D.C., I'm Josie Sturman. In 2022, the North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners considered a proposed rule change that would require dentists and oral surgeons have a CRNA or an anesthesiologist in the room any time a patient is put under deep sedation. The North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services opposed the requirement, stating it would, quote, create significant access barriers for North Carolina Medicaid beneficiaries and create more demand for anesthesia professionals to work in dental and oral maxillofacial surgery offices than there is at present time. Thousands of men, women, and children are waiting for an organ donation and a new chance at life. Still to come, we examine the need for living donors and the benefits of giving and receiving an organ. But first, the art of solving a crime. When all is said and done, that's the important thing, is that these individuals are identified. We know their names. We show you how digital detectives armed with gaming technology draw closure to cold cases. The National Crime Information Center reports between 2007 and 2020, on average, more than 600,000 people went missing in the United States every year. Alongside that statistic, in 2004, the U.S. Department of Justice estimated 4,400 unidentified bodies are recovered every year, with approximately 1,000 of those bodies still unidentified a year later. To help address the staggering number, analysts with the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation are teaming up with researchers from The Ohio State University to take Jane and John Doe cases in a new direction. They're adapting technology used to create digital characters and games to help put names with faces. Reporter Jessica Schmidt takes an in-depth look at the process. Sitting on a shelf inside Samantha Molnar's office are sculptures that have helped solve cases. Being able to work on these cases and bring names back and then maybe even charges is the best feeling. For close to a decade, Samantha has worked as a criminal intelligence analyst and forensic artist at the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation, a path she carved out for herself even as a child. I used to watch this stuff as a kid and always dream about being able to do this. After undergoing training, she learned how to recreate a person's face based on their skeletal remains. I really want to pull out that overbite or that broken nose or whatever it may be. Law enforcement officials first try using dental records, fingerprints, or DNA to lead them to an identification. If that doesn't work, Samantha steps in and creates a sculpture using the person's skull. With help from a team at Ohio State University, using photogrammetry, they can replicate real-world objects. They just take pictures on an iPhone of the skull, and they put it into a program that can generate 
um, a 3D model of that skull. It prints really well um, on a 3D printer, and then I will just sculpt on top of that 3D copy. It typically takes about a month for her to finish shaping and structuring her clay creation. You're going to look around this room and you're going to see faces that look very different but all of them follow the exact same process. So it's the muscle structure, the tissue depth markers, and then building the face. I do use an oil-based clay that doesn't dry. In the past, once Samantha finished building a face, the clay bust would be given to the investigating agency and the artistry really stopped there. But now researchers at OSU, like Jeremy Patterson, are taking technology to a whole new level. We've been able to take a tool that's normally used for game development, for creating digital characters and games, and feed these scans into it and set it up so that it can take the original base sculpt, uh, use that as an indicator of uh, facial structure, and once it's loaded in, it creates a highly variable, very realistic rendition of what this individual might have looked like. If there are questions about the person's facial features, they can alter the realistic digital images in real time. I literally just have a skull. I have a crime scene report that might tell me if there's hair that's found. Maybe there's no hair found. Maybe there's no clothing found and I have no clue what size this person was. You can change hairstyle, uh, eye shape, you know, all of these things that uh, might be off in the sculpt um, because there's not indications of what it might look like, uh, they can be varied within seconds using this other software. They've already used the realistic renderings to hopefully help the Hamilton County coroner identify a woman known only as the Cincinnati Jane Doe. She was found partially buried in a mulch bed in Avondale back in 2018. Her remains were wrapped in a blanket with a rose resting on her chest. It was remarkable. I mean, it was going from seeing this individual as this, you know, clay version of somebody to almost a, you know, a living person again. And it was, it was one of those moments where you look at it and you realize this is this is different it's important it's samantha and jeremy's goal when called upon to give those jane and john does the respectful reunions they deserve by giving them back their names before returning their remains to loved ones it's extremely emotional we become so invested in these cases um, as analysts and then it's even more personal i would say working with the actual remains of this person um, especially some of these people have had some really awful things happen to them. I'm hoping all of them will be solved. When all is said and done, that's the important thing, is that these individuals are identified. We know their names. Samantha says in a lot of these cases, the Jane and John Doe's have not been reported missing or they disappeared from another state, so they are not in Ohio system, which makes it even harder to find family. Samantha and Jeremy think these new digital images, once shared, could lead to more people coming forward. Once they believe they do know someone's identity, they usually rely on DNA testing to confirm it. In Cincinnati, I'm Jessica Schmidt. Still to come, a husband inspired to share his caregiving journey after his wife's terminal cancer diagnosis. As often as Sharon told me that I was her motivation to keep living, it was actually the other way around. She was my motivation. But first, patients struggling with a life-threatening illness are given a second chance. We hear from living organ donors about the process of donating and how it affected their lives. The Cleveland Clinic says there's an urgent need for healthy people to donate certain organs and tissues. For example, you can donate a kidney and go on to live a totally normal life after surgery. Living organ donors can also donate part of a lung, liver, a section of intestine, or part of their pancreas. Today, we hear from two women who decided to donate a kidney and learn what these living donors gained during the process. In Atlanta, Rachel Prisby is in the best shape of her life. So I'm out running, I'm hiking on the weekends, um, I'm even doing things like stair workouts. And she's doing it with only one kidney. I actually donated to a stranger um, on the kidney registry. So someone in New Jersey uh, got my kidney and I don't know anything about them. Um, we haven't made contact. 
but um, I hear that they're doing well, and I, I think about them pretty much every day. Every day, the list of people in need of a kidney grows longer. The United Network for Organ Sharing, our UNOS, says it set a new record in 2022 with more than 25,000 kidney transplants performed. But for the more than 90,000 people in the United States still waiting for a new kidney, the donation process can be long and agonizing. When you do dialysis, you're so tired and sick. When you come home, you don't feel like it. The next day, you're recovering, and then it's time to go back. Nearly two years ago, Katherine Davis was on dialysis due to kidney failure. Katherine worried she would have to wait years for a transplant. To her surprise, a friend at her church came to the rescue. God laid it on my heart. This is what you're supposed to do. And I never thought about it my whole life. It's just crazy how God works. If you're considering becoming a living donor, the process includes tests to make sure you're in good physical and mental health. You must also be 18 years or older, though some hospitals require donors to be at least 21. The procedure itself lasts about three hours, and you'll spend a few days in the hospital after the surgery. It's a safe procedure for the majority of really healthy people. Dr. Todd Merchant is a transplant surgeon in Greenville, South Carolina. He says transplant teams also check to make sure living donors aren't at risk for future health problems. So we'll look at patients, make sure they're not diabetic or, or hypertensive, because those are two of the main factors that will precipitate kidney failure in the future for people, and make sure they're not obese. Wendy says it took her about three weeks to recover from the surgery. Overall, I've not had any issues. I told Catherine I, I would do it all over again. Back in Georgia, Rachel joined a nonprofit group called Kidney Donor Athletics and trained to climb three volcanoes in Guatemala. Rachel says donating a kidney has taught her she can make a difference and live the life she wants to at the same time. I'm not a hero. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not that special. <laughs> I just had the had a good kidney and was able to, to share my spare. Um, so I think it's something that a lot of people could could potentially do too. Rachel Prisby recently joined more than a dozen other kidney donors completing the Volcano Challenge. The group hiked three volcanoes in Guatemala during the one kidney climb. They say their goal was to show kidney donors can live a long, healthy, active life full of adventure. So I think the key is here not to be afraid to give the gift of life. You can still go on and do fun things. So she and all these others are such heroes. You hear yeah. about people, you know, giving after they pass away, but not a lot about, you know, while they're still living. And as you said, they can live a healthy, full life after. Very inspiring. And the Mayo Clinic says about 5,000 living kidney donations are performed each year in the United States. You can visit the UNOS website at unos.org for detailed information on organ donation. One man's life changed after his wife received a devastating diagnosis. She had cancer, it was in her liver, she had 20 tumors. Up next, how their journey inspired him to provide a voice for his fellow caregivers. Very beautiful, both inside and out. In sickness and in health, a husband becomes a caregiver for the love of his life. Alan Rubel is like the 38 million people in the United States who the AARP says provided care for a family member. Reporter Joe Carroll shows us how Alan turned what his wife saw as a burden into his greatest blessing. In 1967, Alan Rubel traveled from his home in Barrie to Montreal to visit a cousin. While there, he spotted a dark-haired beauty named Sharon Birch. She was walking her dog, and I saw her, and I said, I want to meet that lady. She was 17, and he was 21. Young love that lasted a year. The two went their separate ways. But three decades later, the flame flickered again after Sharon became widowed and Alan divorced. Very beautiful, both inside and out. They became a couple, and life was good. But their lives changed forever in 2005, when she went in for a routine checkup. She had cancer, it was in her liver. She had 20 tumors that were in her liver, but it wasn't liver cancer. She had neuroendocrine tumors, a rare and slow-moving cancer. She was in a hospital a lot, but I don't think there, ha there wasn't one person that was next to her that didn't become a friend. Alan was her caregiver, and at times it would be overwhelming. 
very low. Yeah. And I, I wanted to find a cure. I wanted to help her. In fact, she got angry when you did yeah, that. Yeah, she got very angry at me because it was a private thing to her. 11 years of going back and forth to Mass General Hospital every three weeks. This was your idea? Yeah. Alan put his thoughts into words for a book he co-wrote called The Greatest Burden, The Greatest Blessing. The collections released this summer include his story along with observations of 43 other caregivers. They have one thing in common. They step up to the plate and they do what they need to do for the ones they love. Don't get me wrong, Sharon could be a very stubborn woman, but that also saved her life. She had a burning desire to live. I would have done things differently at times, but as a caregiver, I need to remember that this was her disease, not mine. I always tried to be tender and gentle, but there were times I reached a breaking point. Sharon would say something that would be very hurtful to me, but in a time I realized it was the cancer speaking, not Sharon. What Alan hopes these stories will show other caregivers, they are not alone. Either you're gonna be a caregiver, you're gonna know a caregiver, but you're gonna get involved somehow. Sharon died over five years ago. It took me a while to, you know, to adjust being alone. Alan has started a new chapter in his life with a new relationship, but he'll never forget the blessings he received taking care of Sharon. As often as Sharon told me that I was her motivation to keep living, it was actually the other way around. She was my motivation. And that's it for us on Investigate TV Plus. I'm Lee Zurich. And I'm Tisha Powell. Thanks for watching. Next time on Investigate TV Plus, solving a teacher shortage isn't always simple math. Group them up into two separate groups. We visit a school district that may have found an answer. Is a 40 school week as a teacher a perk? It is. And find out how it's impacting students and their families.